morning, everyone. As Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, I'm delighted to host this event as part of the first Assembly Women's Week. Tonight's event is the final event of what has been a full schedule of activities throughout the week. During my time in office, I have sought to continue to highlight the need for greater female representation in this Assembly, uh, and on the basis that if the Assembly is to respect the community it represents, it must better reflect the fact that the majority of our population is female. I'm therefore delighted to welcome Dr. Helen Pankhurst here tonight. Dr. Pankhurst's great-grandmother, Emmeline Pankhurst, is undoubtedly the leading historic figure who comes to mind when we think of the right of the fight for votes for women. Her fight in a different time and a different social context was a long and difficult one, which must have required great personal courage and commitment. The case, I think, has been proven by those who have went before, but the opportunity is for us, first of all, to, to achieve equality, and that means 51% of, uh, of this assembly being, uh, in its elected form being uh, represented by women, and then it means them addressing the issue of the social and economic change that will follow that. So the film we will watch tonight, Suffragette, focuses on the foot soldiers of the early feminist movement. But as we all watch it, we should recall that rights are not always given easily. We should therefore not take them for granted. Helen is a great example of that as she continues to campaign on women's issues both in the UK and abroad as a women's rights activist and a senior advisor to Care International based in the UK and in Ethiopia. Her work in Ethiopia includes support to program development focused on the interests and the needs of women and girls. So while this week we focus on that fact that we have more to achieve here, I do want us to remember that there are many parts of the world where the status of women in their society is still far from the vision of the suffragettes. We cannot expect to fight and encourage for women in those parts of the world if we aren't still striving to improve them here and setting an example. The issue of women's rights takes so long. If we just focus on the suffragette movement, it took so long that the filmmakers had a dilemma. At what point do you start the story and at what point do you finish it? They decided to focus on two pivotal years, 1912 and 1913. Um, but very much, you will see that in terms of how it ends, the baton has been passed on to us. So I hope that as the film finishes, you have gone through a journey of one woman's politicization, why she became involved, why it was so important, but it brings us to the present and why it continues to be important for us to get involved, not only in the type of events that took place here today with a week of planning for the Northern Ireland Assembly to be that much more inclusive, but in many other ways how we can all ensure that we continue on that journey. So um, I can't say enjoy, it's the wrong, it's the wrong verb, but um, I hope you are moved and inspired. Thank you. It's a real privilege to have with us this evening Dr. Helen Pankhurst. You may have heard her on the radio this morning. Uh, she's been doing quite a number of events today as well. And um, I must say, you know, having watched that, the first thing that I, I feel I need to ask you is, what's it like being called Pankhurst? Um, how has it affected your life when, when we see how important that was and how important the whole issue of votes for women and women's rep representation continues to be? I don't think I ever thought of changing my name. I think it was so evident that it was such a powerful film, such a powerful film, film on mine, such a powerful name. Um, so I was brought up in Ethiopia and I used to come to the UK during the summer and that was when I would hear people ask me about the name. In Ethiopia it had other connotations to do with my fa father being a historian. Um, but so I was very proud of the name, increasingly so as I understood more and more what it meant. Um, and also as I understood some of the complexities of the issue, some of the schisms within the movement and within the family that I alluded to by the film. Um, so I've been very proud to have that name. And my daughter has it as well, and she's the fifth generation. And I've said that to a number of people who've commented on the fact that that's so rare. You know, it, it shouldn't be just the Pankhurst name that's carried down through women 
generation after generation, because otherwise what it means is we're still continuing to value men's name, men's heritage more than women, and it just shouldn't be that way. Well, we, we asked you when you were coming in, and I know Helen's very keen to hear from you. There's no point in, in us fighting for women to have a voice and then having you all sit there and us two sitting up here without being able to hear from you. And I know that quite a number of you uh, did send us up questions. So um, we've got um, a couple of roving mics um, and Amy Barr had a question. Would you put your hand up, Amy, and let us know where you are? I would like to know what you have to say to young women um, who are disengaged from politics in today's society and feel that they don't have a role to play, perhaps. So I understand disengagement. I mean, I understand it because uh, of the party political system, which might not reflect one's views. I understand it because of the first-past-the-post type approaches. There's so many reasons why... Um, some people don't vote, but I often think that it's the people who most need to vote who don't vote. So it's those that are most disenfranchised who don't vote, and therefore you perpetuate the problem. So an abdication of that little power that you have is not a solution. I also think that the voting is just one aspect, and increasingly over time, compared to the reality 100 years ago. I think that now we have so many ways in which we can make a difference through, um, through social media, through internet um, activism, through linkages, through so many um, networks of change, etc. So um, I, think, I, I think it's critically important that people vote. I think it's critically important that you have a civil society that's accountable to and makes government accountable to it. Um, not voting is just not the solution to an imperfect world. I just wondered if um, in 2016 that there are any female role models that stand out to you, either in political or in public life. You know, I have so much admiration for any woman in politics today, anywhere in the world. And I feel like a really big clap from everybody here who feels that as well. So... Women in politics today, I mean, just incredible women because there's so much discrimination still. I also have incredible admiration for women in countries where even just speaking, even just <laughs> driving in a car, even just going on a bicycle um, is considered as militant as some of the actions that people did here. Um, I watched recently a film called Speed Sisters, which is about some women in the Middle East who are racing um, car drivers. Women in the Middle East as racing car drivers. It's an incredibly courageous thing to do, and they are transforming um, communities' attitudes and um, views about what a woman can or can't do. In Janine, in the West Bank, um, the, there's this one youngster who's now kind of change the whole community's views about um, what a woman can or can't do. So uh, they are the ones that spring to mind for me immediately. But what about, what about other people? What about you, Michelle? Oh, um, well, I, I think uh, probably most of us at the moment find Arlene Foster quite inspirational, isn't it? Fantastic to have a, a female first minister for the first time. Um, May Blood, uh, I must say, I would go along with as well. And we've had some inspirational people who have who have come here as well. I mean, uh, I was very friendly, since you mentioned racing car drivers, with um, Baroness Denton, who was one of our ministers here back in the, the bad old days when uh, we weren't in charge ourselves. Uh, and she was a real woman's champion, had been a racing driver herself. Uh, and uh, she was pretty inspirational now, I must say. So... But you, you talked about those women in the, in the Middle East and, and the, the fight that they have to put up. And I read something that you had said, Helen, at one stage where you talked about living at a dangerous time where repressive ideas could take hold and the fact that, that the advances that have been made by women um, weren't, weren't nailed down, if you like, that, that, that there was a chance that in some places that we might slip back a bit. Yeah. I believe that very strongly. I mean, it's partly issues to do with fundamentalism wherever we see that. And I suppose we're very aware of Islamic fundamentalism, but it exists in many other religions and many other countries as well. And I think you only have to have 
some regressive ideas like that in one part of the world for them to infiltrate others. I mean, also on some of the UN conventions and things, um, I know that every year there's a battle not just to keep pushing forward, but to maintain some of the rights that have been gained. And the, 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 it's not just, by any means, um, fundamentalist Islamic countries that are pushing back. It's always often the Vatican and it's many other powers as well. So I believe that the world has always been interconnected, ever more so every day. And we just can't afford to allow, just to say, well, that's not affecting me. That's another race, it's another part of the world, it's another somebody. I think any, any discrimination, any lack of understanding of others haunts us all. Could a female president in the United States make a big difference? I hope so, although Barack Obama was constrained in very many ways in terms of his ability to make difference in terms of color and in many other ways. So um, it's not a given. I think individuals can make a difference, but I think movements are much stronger and we all can, we all have to, we can't rely on a single person, I think is what I'm trying to say. We were wondering what, if you had any advice for two um, teenage like women's rights activists in trying to further the rights of women in Northern Ireland and just everywhere else across the world. I, I personally think that connections are very important. So I think you can do things such as through internet, get involved, understand the world that you live in. And that means not just your local world, but the global one. Um, there are all sorts of um, campaigns and things like that that you can put your name to, especially, I think, once you're 18. But also, go out on the streets, link up. I think marches are incredibly powerful today as they ever were. I think links between civil society and, um, and your representatives, parliament, um, the assembly, all of that is really important. Not working in isolation, not thinking that any of you can do it um, on your own. Within your schools, within, the, within your homes, within your homes, so important. Don't ignore the inequalities that at their roots are often in terms of your relationships with your brothers, with your parents, how your mother's treated in the, in the family. You know, all, of, all of that, the casual sexism that we encounter, stand up for it, be part of, be, be mobilizers for change. Meryl Streep, of course, fights very hard for uh, women's rights in the acting profession uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and I wonder um, when she, she plays um, a very large part in, uh, w w for someone who's only in, in the movie for <laughs> a few seconds, really, but, yeah. but her presence is there. Yeah. Um, how important was the fact that, that that actually is what she is like, mm. do you think, to, to the fact that she was playing mm. your great-grandmother? Mm. So there's a lot I could tell you about all of this. Um, I mean, firstly, her coming on board was incredibly important for the film because from a certain visibility, it, it raised it. So her presence, because she is such a well-liked, such an incredible you know, leader in her field, her agreeing to, make, to take on that role meant that the film got a lot more visibility. The second point that's quite interesting is she has this tiny part. And in some ways, that, that um, mimics the fact that actually somebody like Maud wouldn't really have had a chance to engage that much in the leader of the movement. So the fact that she's only there for a few seconds and yet is there all the time is very much what would have been the reality at the time. It's caused some, a number of controversies and a number of problems for the films as well. So one of them has been the argument that it's an American. Why did you choose an American? Couldn't you have chosen a Brit? So that caused some issues. The other one was that because she was an American, she brought to how people saw the film the issue of how the suffrage movement and the civil rights movement clashed in the States. So in the States, um, the issues of color were incredibly important at the time that the suffrage issues were, were being campaigned for. They were not in the UK. In the UK, there was, this was pre massive immigration. This was at a time when we only know of two suffragettes, uh, sorry, two suffragettes who were not white, two Asian suffragettes. But the whole controversy of should the film have included some black actors distract, detracted a bit and was 
slightly off topic, really, for the UK. It was very important in the US, but it was not really relevant in the UK. But it led to a bit of a backlash on the film, which was accused of whitewashing. Very sad, really, for many reasons, including the fact that Sarah Gavron's previous film had been Brick Lane, which was a film only about Bangladeshi women. And she had felt, she had made a conscious decision not to just include a tokenistic um, one shot of maybe um, Sophia Dilip Singh, who was a, uh, an aristocratic woman. So in other words, she chose not to do something just tokenistic, but it backlashed in that one of the main accusations of the film was why didn't it address the color issue, which is incredibly important in the States, is important in terms of diversity today, but wasn't part of the suffragette movement at the time. So that was one, and it was made worse by um, the, the main actors having a T-shirt that had um, the words, I'd rather be a rebel than a slave, which was then interpreted in terms of Confederate white rather than slave black. So that kind of fueled the issue. Um, you mentioned that the T-shirts the with I'd rather be a rebel than a slave, and actually Claire O'Neill, who maybe will give us a wave, ha had asked a question about that, about what, what you thought about that. Yeah. So, I mean, um, Emmeline would have been horrified that, this, that those words were taken out of context the way uh, they were. She was a, a, one of her first campaigns was as um, supporting the uh, anti-slavery campaign as a young child. Meryl Streep is obviously very hurt and upset that it was all interpreted that way. To the extent that it raises the discussion that we're even talking about colour and diversity, that's important. But it's unfortunate that it was done in this way. We were wondering um, what similarities you draw between Emily and yourself. I think I'm more like Sylvia, my grandmother, in that I think fundamentally I believe in the importance of coalitions and democracy as more powerful than single-minded determination. I think you need both. I think movements need very charismatic leaders, very single-minded leaders. And both Emmeline and um, Christabel, her oldest daughter, are in that mind. But Sylvia was a unifier. She believed in the importance of connecting people across other differences. And for me, if ever there's a place where that's needed, that's here. And I would value her approaches even more than those of Emmeline. Someone who hasn't put their, their name on this says, what would you envisage gender equality would be like for your great-granddaughter mm -hmm. in 2116? You know, the women of 1916 couldn't possibly have imagined life for today's 21st century woman. What would you like to see? The main difference uh, visually between uh, the world now and the world 100 years ago, I think is in the public space. It's when you go down streets. I've seen images of London um, 100 years ago, and when you see the street scenes, you just see men, um, very, very few women. Um, and I think that has changed. You go down any public street, you go outside, and you see as, men, as many women as you do men. Uh, in the homes, I think there's still so much inequality. And in terms of cultural perceptions and things like that, there's so much. In terms of the naming issue I mentioned earlier. So I think what I'd love to see is equality right across the different areas. And then there's small things that bug me that maybe that shouldn't. But the amount of time that women spend dressing up, putting their makeup on, putting high-heeled shoes on. I mean, excuse me, but aeroplanes and high-heeled shoes... It says, take your high-heeled shoes off if you're on an aeroplane. What does that mean? Does that mean half the women are going to die because they've taken off their shoes because they've had high-heeled shoes on the planes? I mean, it's a silly example, but there's so many ways in which we, are, we waste time as women. We're forced to waste time as women. We let ourselves waste time as women because we're, we're looked at differently. The media listens to us differently. So... All these things that are, these little things that seem silly on their own, but actually add up to a world 
where we're treated so differently. I'd like all of those to go. When let us be whoever we want to be. If we want to dress up, let's dress up, whether we're male, female, or in between. If we want to um, stay at home and do the ironing, let us do that, but because we want to, not because society tells us that's what we have to do. That seems like a good reply. Whoever it was that answered asked that question. Someone else uh, who hasn't signed this uh, asked a question. If Emmeline Pankhurst were alive today, what do you think she would see as the greatest advancement uh, in women's rights? And also, what would be her greatest disappointment? Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in other views on this, but I think probably advancement would be in education. The fact that now women are doing so well um, right across the board in education, even in STEM uh, subjects, although those are the ones where um, they're still lagging behind. But generally, in terms of education, um, they have done so well. I think she would be really angry still that they, we don't have equality in terms of the political sphere, because that is so fundamental, you know, that without, at the highest level of political systems and on boards and economically, if we don't have women equally represented, then we don't have policies that rep represent women's views equally and so on. So I think she'd be really angry with the rate of, of change on that. Cool. Helen, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to leave it at that, I think, because uh, you've been answering questions for quite a long time. Uh, it's been utterly fascinating. Uh, I'm sure everyone will agree. It's been fantastic to have you here today uh, and to have had the privilege of, of seeing that terrific film yeah. uh, about your great-grandmother and, and her fantastic struggle, supported by all the mods and, and Emily's as well. Yeah. And uh, could I ask Paula Bradley, MLA, if she would come and, uh, and give a vote of thanks? Thank can, you very much. Can I say oh, one word just before that, which is I came with views about how much still need to be d done here, with having looked at the figures. I've been so impressed with what I've heard about what's been going on recently. I hope this isn't a one-off, that I'll come back, and that next time I come back, those youngsters that ha hadn't voted will have voted, and a lot of those ideas about how young people will make a difference are beginning to show you know, massive differences, and those figures, those, at the end of the day, the figures are so important, those figures will be radically different. I really look forward to coming back and, and knowing more, seeing more. Well, Helen, can I, on behalf of everyone present here this evening, uh, thank you so much for bringing about a, a special added dimension to this, our finale of uh, International Women's Week. And can I also thank you, Wendy. Um, I know you've been here before. You have uh, been here before again, debating on, on women uh, and women in politics. And I've just a, a few other thank yous to do. Uh, can I first thank you, uh, say thank you to our speaker, Mitchell McLaughlin. Katrina Rowan and I went in to see the speaker just before Christmas and said, Mr. Speaker, we have a couple of little ideas. We'd like to run past you. Because International Women's Week is coming up and it's something that's really important to us. Just one or two. We didn't even have the finer details of them. And we kind of ambushed in, in his office and he came forward. Him, his staff, our secretary at Politics Plus came forward with one of the most exciting weeks that we have ever had here in the Assembly. It has been truly fantastic. So thank you to you and thank you to all of that team that put about this, this wonderful programme. So again, thank you very much for attending. We have come not only to the end of our evening, but to the end of our Assembly Women's Week. And I hope, uh, against all hopes, that all of our women of our Assembly are returned, plus a lot more. So can I wish you all a very safe journey home and just give you one little piece of advice. On May the 5th, get out and vote. Thank you.